Good afternoon. My name is Ron Allen, I'm the president of Christos Medical. Today, I want to thank Joe and Mike for inviting us here. It's tough to be on the podium the last presentation after having great presentations so forth before you. A couple quick points about Chrysalis. We are a medical device company. We're very, very selective as to what we do because we self-fund. We spend no time going and chasing dollars. Yeah, you can do it and you might be successful. But the reality of it is in our side of the business, if the, if the concept is functional and there's data behind it and it makes rational sense and there's a possibility, a great possibility, I should say more than a possibility, that you're going to have a positive impact on the patient, you should take a look at it. And that's what we do. In short, what we basically do is we'll take a look at a lot of different products, devices. And the first question we have is, is it technology effective? Will it do those things it is a claim to do from the various companies and schools, universities, other manufacturers who come and speak to us? <clears throat> and is it safe? It has to be safe. Because at the end of the day, all of us are working on people. So you don't want to end up with a concept or a project that is, well, it could be safe if you only do a couple different things with it, right? <clears throat> is it an improvement over the current technology? Sounds very basic, but you'll see, and you may have seen many devices that have been presented Maybe not here, because this is high-tech research, but in other locations, that is just really a knockoff, I think you use that phrase, a knockoff of a prior type or current device. We do not look at knockoffs. If you can advance the technology, then don't, don't mess with it. It has to be cost-effective, cost-effective. How many of you had chance or even heard of the EpiPen? Have you, did you get a chance to see that presentation on, on, can you imagine yourself sitting across from congressmen who are at the very least upset about cost? So we, as well as Shu, must consider costs as when we develop new devices and treatments for patients. If in fact, the cost makes sense because we have a new wheel doesn't mean that we can charge a gazillion bucks for it. We're looking at a disruptive device. If in fact you've met those other four criteria, your device is more than likely disruptive to the current treatment profile. And that allows us to bring a product to market. If, in fact, you haven't met that, then there's no reason to talk to Christus. We will listen, but I don't think we're going to be very responsive. Again, we are self-funded. We spend no time going and chasing dollars other than my partners. We always chase each other. Can I get five more bucks so I can get home today? We looked at the hemodialysis market, and as you know, in this particular area, patients have but two options. They are in renal failure. They have the option, potentially, of getting a new kidney. Or they have the option of getting a catheter so they can go through hemodialysis. In the United States today, there's about 600,000 or so patients who go through this treatment on a two or three day, every day, I'm correction, two or three times a week they go through this process. <clears throat> so there is something to happen here. Anyway, on the slide to your left is the placement of a catheter into the major blood vessel. 
And as you can see on the slide to your right, the tip of that catheter is seated in the vessel. The goal of hemodialysis is to take blood and filter it from the patient. It goes through a cleaning process for the lack of a more technical term. And the patient seating in a chair comfortable could be talking to their neighbor on their laptop. I mean, if you've ever been to a dialysis center, these patients develop little groups and they want to make sure that the conversation we were having two days ago, we're going to continue when we come back. Okay, so it's a, it's a pretty big deal. So you say, well, what is the issue? That's currently what we're doing in the marketplace. The issue is in most normal human beings, when you place an implant into that human, the body reacts to that. And it forms a protective tissue around that implant. Now this catheter is gonna be seeding in the patient for a long time. And the fact is, as, <clears throat> as you can see in both of these slides, this is a normal biological issue. The tissue clogs the ports of the catheter. So you say, well, okay. So you, what do you do? Um, remember, this is in a major blood vessel. So you can't just stick a rotor down through there and so open those, open those catheters up. <clears throat> it is a major issue if you are a hemodialysis patient. No question. You have to do something about that. So what do we do? You either remove it, remove the catheter from the patient. Remember, you have to have dialysis two or three times a week. So this is not when you call your doc and say, you know, can you get me in tomorrow? Because there may be other patients in front of you. But at the same time, you still must get this resolved. Have to get it resolved. So you have to, in most cases, call your treating physician. You end up going to either the surgery center or the hospital and to have the catheter either removed and replaced or they can use another technique and I'll show you that. This is expensive. If you've been into an operating room, even in the most low cost centers, this is an expensive process. And if you think about how often you have to do that, it gets to be even more expensive. So you think costs, you think potential issue to the patient, you think resolution to the issue in some kind of functional way. And also think you don't have a bunch of time. Time is not on your side here. So what do, take, what, what do we do? We looked at the cause, we recognized the issue. We said, I think we can advance the standard of care to this patient population. So where did we come? Right where we're standing. We work with Unimed, Michael and Joe, Dr. Florescu, I'm gonna say 20 months ago, I think at this point, 20 months ago. And I'm gonna show you what we did. This is a standard set of circumstances the picture on your, your left is a case where if you take a look at the arrow, that's the tip of a catheter, hemodialysis catheter, that is clogged. If you take a look at the B picture, the one top on your right, they're using a guide wire, very narrow guide wire, through the catheter, working its way down to the tip of the guide wire, correction of the catheter, as you can see with that second arrow. On the lower, your left, <clears throat> you can see that the uh, guide wire has been placed, an angioplasty balloon, very thin, that you'd use traditionally in vascular surgery and sometimes in neurosurgery to treat aneurysms. And that will allow uh, physicians to put in stents, both in the lower body as well as into the brain area. They've opened that, they've used an angioplasty balloon. So 
to break the tissue. And in the lower right-hand side, you can see they use a xenogram or a dye. They've injected a dye through the catheter to ensure that the catheter is open. Pretty slick. It beats surgery, big time, or the replacement of the balloon. So we came to the university and we spoke to the team here, became very interested, and we said, I think that you guys here have a solution to this problem. And we, and we want the solution, by the way. So what is the solution? Treat the patient inside the dialysis unit. Don't send them to the OR. Do not replace that catheter not unless you have other major issues. And in most cases, those are not the cause. Bring the patient out. So we developed a series of catheters in terms of size, put them in a package, sterilize them, properly label them to make sure they would meet FDA requirements as well as patient and facility requirements. They're offered sterile, ready to go. Not too dissimilar than I saw someone else's product here today. Again, goal must be effective, must be innovative from the standpoint it's disruptive to current treatment profiles, and it cannot introduce new issues or new risks to the patient. So the two graphics that you see in front of you, the top graphic is a standard hemodialysis catheter. The bottom graphic is the chrysalis catheter, which looks very similar, other than that balloon at the distal tip. The balloon, the catheter looks the same going in, as you can see on the top, but we can open that catheter by using the balloon as often as we need to make sure we don't see, if you recall that thick fibrous growth that you saw on the prior slide, you won't get that. Yeah, we can actually break that sheath if we do it often enough and maintain the catheter's patency over time. Pretty slick. So, it's disruptive, meaning that you don't have to go back. We're going to continue to change catheters. I don't know how many of you who are maybe aware of being in a dialysis center, but you only need to go a couple times and you'll get a feel for the issues this portion of the patient population experiences. It's pretty significant. Obviously, they have great uh, insight and attitudes because it's not an easy task for them to go through. <clears throat> so. Reduce the number of catheters you're going to need going forward. Reduce the number of potential surgeries you may need, replacement surgeries, and do it at a reasonable cost. The animal study, which gave us so much confidence to move this project forward, three different phases, passed all three phases. So where are we today? We're at 20 four months into the project. Um, I was hoping that two members of my team would be here. We can actually show you real packaged product. We're going to the FDA in December, just so we can finish the final element report. And this product, I gotta find those guys at Medtronic who pay 700 gazillion dollars. Um, this product will be on the market in about 150, 160 days. The key to it is, at least for us, it has to be disruptive in terms of it has to make an advancement to the current standard of care. It has to be cost effective. So you say, well, Ron, how much are you guys going to sell that thing for? Based on the CMS numbers today, it's $400 per catheter, and just by a show of hands, do you think we should go over $400? No, and we're not. 
okay, we're going to try and come in. So we have a more effective, I shouldn't say more effective, we have an advanced product. It's going to do more for the patient and it's going to cost at least as much as the current treatment profile and the patient's going to have a, a stronger outcome. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious about, about safety, since you mentioned safety. Absolutely. So it, it would seem that the most likely complication from a catheter change might be embolic uh, uh, sequelae. Mm -hmm. What do you expect the rate of sequelae with more catheter compared to the standard catheter? We do not, we have not seen, in, in animal testing, we haven't seen any, nothing going upstream. We were really concerned about that. Uh, on the way into this concept. So we spent some time doing that kind of, uh, okay, make it a little thinner, make the balloon be a little stronger, um, make it a little later, where you have uh, striations of this fibrous material, but it's not mm, as mature as it could be four months, five months, six months into the program. We haven't seen that. We were con truly concerned about embolic loading. Yes, sir. Uh, I want you to speak a little bit about the, some of the issues you have found from going to, you know, from an idea to the market. Hmm. Because you talked about, you know, you're almost approved by the FDA, which is, is super wonderful. So I want you to elaborate a little bit more about the, the difficulties from doing that. Okay. So I, I've happened, both myself and my partners have spent 40 plus, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> uh, many years in the industry. I mean, I worked for Stryker uh, as a VP, uh, worked for Boston uh, as a VP. So and my partners have similar resumes. So when we take a look at the, I mean, we sort of understand the requirements for most, the FDA approval, if you will, of most devices. And we certainly have enough communication with the agency that we can call and say, hey, Joe, uh, uh, this is what we're thinking. Um, do you have any guidance documents? If there are none, in most cases, it's going to be a stack this big. Right? So it's not that difficult if you start early. We spend a lot of time making sure that the device that we're looking at is proper in terms of the patient treatment profile. What is the clinical history of this patient treatment profile? You know, can we hurt this patient? We can give, we can give them a lot of new devices, but are you gonna experience a lot of embolic events? That's a big deal. It's a super big deal. So it's the investigation, it's the planning and execution stepwise. Um, and it's not, at least from our experience, um, it's not wasting a bunch of time on what ifs that are not locked into clinical application or prior clinical reporting. And I mean, the, the area, just today, we, it's amazing <laughs> some of the things that we're seeing. Um, so yeah, we're excited by it. I'm gonna, to take my presentation of 10 minutes and turn it into how do you move a product from here to completion of FDA. Um, I teach a course at Cal State. And, uh, and even that, I run out of time. Okay. Glad to answer any more questions if I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.